And now for our next student speaker, some of you have heard it before and all of you can't wait to hear it again. It's Courtney Ray. Awesome, thank you. Um, so today I wanna focus on one of the key insights from my dissertation, and that's understanding how plants interact through dispersal um, and seed retention. Um, just to start off, um, I want to highlight I had numerous collaborators, undergrads, SBOOM faculty, um, and none of this work would be possible without them. And where my research starts off and, and a lot of the big concepts and ideas I think about uh, revolve around community assembly. And so there's um, kind of a series of steps we typically think of for how a species or an organism comes to occur in a certain landscape. So if you look, for example, at all the possible things, you have the regional species pool with an alphabet shape of what might occur. And then you have dispersal. So the first idea is that for a plant or an organism to be present in the community, it must first arrive. And then there's a series of filters. So there's an abiotic filter that's generally considered just to be the environment. Can the organism tolerate and physically sustain himself in a given a sit, uh, set of situations? And then there's biotic interactions. And often that filter is thought to be competition. Will an organism be pushed out um, due, from an environment due to their interactions? And then there's inter, uh, feedbacks among species on these filters. Um, sure. Um, so what some of those feedbacks might be microclimate modification. And that's a process through which plants can alter how much water is available, the local temperatures, and that might make an environmental filter less severe than it otherwise might be. And so when I entered grad school, I really was interested in these ideas of community assembly and understanding kind of these three different processes. And I wanted to especially focus on the first one, dispersal and chance. So in a lot of community assembly models, we think of this as a stochastic process. And a lot of the underlying reason for that is it's really hard to track where seeds end up, where plants come from. Um, but we have some ideas about uh, seeds and also how they interact with through these filters. And so I started by first thinking about what are some reasons that plants might occur in different types of environments. So start off kind of the foundational idea about plant interactions and how they feed back into these filters is Ray Calloway's work. A lot of it was done in the mid nineties, early aughts. And that just shows that at lower elevations where there's that are considered less environmentally, environmentally severe, there's um, effects of having neighbors. So in this control, that means neighbors are present. And then in the clear circles, neighbors are removed. And we don't see that much difference in survival, but there is a benefit of having neighbors removed. Um, and then at higher elevations, which we consider more environmentally severe, we see a large uh, difference in that uh, survival effect. And we also see that the control, meaning that plants have neighbors, they have much higher survival. And so that's the first filter. And that's that feedback of interactions making it potentially more possible for an organism to incur in the environment. But that doesn't really yet get at that dispersal, that first filter. So why might organisms occur close to each other? So we have, um, not many people are able to track seeds, but the folks who do often use soil cores uh, done at different distances from plants. So you might look really close to certain types of vegetation, um, and further away and look at the types of seeds that are collected and in what abundance. Um, and so this was done in some Argentine step. And this focusing on that first column of seed availability, we see that in um, grasses and shrubs and also really close to uh, plants, but in bare soil, plenty of seeds, uh, but away from plants and far away, uh, away from plants and bare soil, no seeds. Um, and so, I'm out and about and looking at plants. And sure enough, if you're looking close enough, you often see lots of seeds um, hot into the infrastructure of leaves and branches. And so that is like a very mechanical process for why species could co-occur. 
we talked about this benefit of having neighbors um, and how it affects that environmental filter, but there also could be earlier stages through dispersal for why plants might co-occur with each other. I'm giving you a little teasers about where I work with and before revealing exactly my system, I just want to talk about this aerial view. So we just think of plants as, I don't know, just milling about at a party and who they're hanging out with. And so at this particular location, we can see that there's plenty of bare soil, plenty of spaces where there's not plants, but we also see clusters where there are plants. And in those areas where there are plants, there's high diversity um, and a high abundance of individuals co-occurring with each other. And so when we think about that mechanical processes that can promote co-occurrence through dispersal, there's a couple different ways that seeds can interact with plants. You might see, for example, a seed leaving a parent plant, encountering a host plant through wind or rain, and it not being trapped or retained. Um, you could also imagine a seed brushing up against the plant, some sort of physical content, contact, and then not being retained. And then finally, you could also imagine situations where a seed encounters a plant and is trapped. That's the, the kind of its situation for life, where it will germinate if it's able to germinate and will it will persist if it's able to recruit. Um, and there's a kind of a suite of features um, and attributes of both the plants and seeds that could promote uh, whether trapping and retention occur. So you might imagine this, this yellow bushy plant, for example, might have a really high probability of trapping, this red color, um, and regardless of the seed, but it's not particularly a good retainer for whatever reason. You can also imagine a host plant like our purple guy, who's very good at retaining seeds, but for some reason, uh, maybe seeds aren't trapped well by that particular species. Um, and in those, both those cases, we don't see really the results or the outcomes dependent on attributes of the seeds. You could also imagine plants that vary in how well they trap and retain seeds. And that difference um, depends on the features of those seeds, whether, for example, they have tufts of, of hair on the top. Um, okay, so now to reveal where I work. Some of you might have guesses but I work in the Rocky Mountains in the Gunnison National For Forest. And I work at um, really high elevation, basically right about tree line, 3,500 meters above sea level. You can see I'm right at that red dot there. And so for my research and like in exploring this first insight, I wanted to ask two questions. One, does the probability of trapping depend on the, ta the, the plant tax on doing the trapping? plant size or the seed identity? And then also question two, does the probability of remaining in a plant following entrapment, does that depend on these attributes of both the plants and the seeds? And so I did a kind of a set of two experiments. Um, here's the map of my field study over on the left. And just to orient you, you can see on the top left, there's some yellow dots. Uh, or orange dots, those represent a long-term census we do. A little below, there's a bunch of blue dots. That's where we did a retention study. Each uh, cross represents a plant. And then further down below the trees there, there's some green crosses and that's where the trapping experiment was done. Uh, why that's important is all of these plants kind of co-occur in the same community, but we're dealing with different individuals. And we did two different experiments. The first, uh, indicated by this top was to test trapping. And so to do that, we built a portable wind tunnel using a leaf blower and just a wind, uh, essentially a, a tube for the wind to blow through um, where you can see a little launch platform, shot seeds into plants and saw whether they were trapped or not. And then the second part of this project was to look at retention and that's manually inserting the seeds um, into plants and seeing how long they persist in those microsites. So those are the, the two projects and part of question one and question two that I'm going to talk about today. So our focal species, kind of species of interest, um, I worked with the six most common species in this alpine field site. Um, conveniently, they represent a, a wide range of growth forms from grasses 
to um, in the bottom right, you see an aster, we have a lupin, and then also some interesting sort of map forming uh, species. And then I also worked with the six most abundant seed taxa that don't necessarily correspond uh, to the plant taxa. Lupin, for example, um, reproduces pretty uh, infrequently in this system. Um, but among the common plants or common seeds, um, we have a couple of different features that really kind of distinguish these groups. One is whether or not there's a uh, pappus on these seeds. The pappus is just the little hair-like appendage at the top. Um, and then also um, kind of the size and the stature of the seeds. So we have some long seeds and some very much more heavy and dense seeds. We also look at the areognum and flower form because often the seed um, actually is dispersed uh, within the flower. So we make comparisons among them. We then looked at the seed functional traits. So we did a principal components analysis just to compare how similar our seed species were to one another. Um, so we looked at um, traits such as dry mass length, pappus length, width, and um, through the principal component analysis, we can see that most of these seed taxa um, aren't functionally similar to each other. But we have a couple of different groups. We have um, over to the left side, plants that are much thicker. So that's that um, green and that orange. And those are kind of heavier seeds um, and larger seeds. And then we have this cluster of the pink, teal, and yellow. And those are those seeds that have a pappus. So those are kind of the almost the two groups that I'm working with, seeds with a pappus and seeds that lack those hairs. Um, to go over the quick overview of the seed trapping experiment, what we did is we fluorescently dyed all the seeds using the type of uh, powder you might see at a holly celebration. Um, and then we did five trapping trials per seed species. So what that means is for each individual plant, they had five seeds of a seed species launched into them. And we looked at the proportion of those seeds that were trapped from that particular um, plant seed combination. We had 10 total focal plants ranging from uh, small to large individuals. And those represented two of our uh, focal plant species, the um, H. velosa, the heretica there on the left and the lupin on the right. And we chose those two species um, because of, due to their commonality and also they're this morpho morphologically different. There's a lot less basal vegetation on the lupin. And we kind of entered this experiment thinking that that basal vegetation might be important for trapping and blocking seeds. Um, so once we launched seeds into the paths of the plant, plants, uh, seeds that were physically touching the plants or directly underneath the plants were considered trap. Seeds that were blown, or were not touching the plants or like blown into the catch net in the back were considered not trapped. We built um, generalized linear models looking at the effect on per the, the proportion that was trapped based on the identity of the plant, identity of the seed, uh, plant size, and then a random effect of that particular individual plant. And what we found is larger plants are much better at trapping seeds than smaller plants. That's our key takeaway. We kind of see um, some differences, especially at larger sizes between the heterotheca and the lupinus in terms of trapping. Those results didn't um, end up being significant, maybe with additional replication. We might be able to tease out some of that signal from the noise. Uh, really interestingly though, we had very little differentiation among seed species in terms of how well they were trapped. So that's one side of the coin, seeds hitting the plant and are they stopped in their path? The next part is how well are they retained? And so for this, we um, inserted manually about 3000 seeds that were also individually dyed so we could track different groups. Um, and those were put into 83 plants using those six seed species and the seed uh, six plant species that we sh I showed in that initial slide. Um, so once they were inserted, then we checked them after two days in the plant, four days and 11. Um, and we have this kind of setup here. I wanted to have a paired comparison to non-vegetated areas. So what I did is um, you see one focal plant up at the top where seeds were inserted. 
And then 30 centimeters away in a non-vegetated area, I just hammered down a nail and that's where the non-vegetated paired comparison is. So you'll see non-vegetated show up in some of the figures coming up. Again, we built a um, complex GLMM to analyze these data, but it's just a binomial variable that I'm considered, considering. So uh, either one, the, uh, the seed dispersed, um, and I consider that at each check. Each check was considered an individual opportunity for that seed to leave the plant. And then I look at it relative to a, multi uh, a multitude of predictors. For example, what was the microsite? Was it vegetated? Uh, what was the identity of the plant? How long between the checks was the seeds um, sitting in the plant? Um, and then the random effect of, was it the first time or the second time I looked at the plant? And what was the plot type, um, an individual site effect? And this project, as you saw from kind of the um, intro and overview of the project has a lot of data. And I wanted to just show you a subset of it today, just so, to like hone in on like what's the main message. And if you have further questions, we can disentangle a very large and colorful spaghetti plot together. But <laughs> the big part is that seed retention varied by host plant, seed taxon, and then also interactions between uh, the seed plant and host taxon. Um, so I wanted to, to um, exemplify this point. I wanted to focus on three of the different microsites. This non-vegetated microsite where there was no vegetation, 30 centimeters away from my focal individuals. Um, the E. umbilatum, the areognum, which is a buckwheat, and it's a mat-forming plant. And the Senecio crassilis, which you can see doesn't have a lot of basal vegetation. Um, and so these are all color coordinated. So areognum's in the orange and senecio is in the teal. And so it's useful first just to look at how these seeds move naturally without any obstacles in their way. And we can see that senecio, um, its probability of being dispersed by the end of the experiment. So as you go to day eight or day 11 is much higher than the probability of the areognum being dispersed. And maybe, you know, your gut would have also told you that if you looked at these seeds. We have the Senecio with a nice, beautiful pappus on it that catches the wind, and the Areognum that's just this basically hard little nut. Um, but then where it gets interesting is depending on the environment these seeds are inserted into. So the Areognum, this mat plant, we still see this trend of Senecio being. Um, having a higher dispersal probability than the areognum, but it's much uh, more diminished compared to the non-vegetated area. And it's very comparable to how well um, the areognum is dispersed in a similar environment. Um, then if we look at how well these seeds are dispersed in the Senecio, which has very low basal uh, vegetation, we see results that are similar to the non-vegetated microsite. So, um, high dispersal of both species, um, but higher dispersal of Senecio compared to the Areognum. Great. The next part is just how do seed traits predict these patterns? Well, this is the last model I'll show you and it's also just a little snippet of all the data. So I'm looking at these principal components that I showed you on that first figure. So things like how heavy the seed are and whether it has a pappus, how does that affect its dispersal, uh, whether it dispersed as a binomial um, outcome. And so what I think is really exciting is that the seed traits do influence whether um, dispersal occurs, but again, the effect depends on the microsite. So I think it's again useful just to focus on that first, no plants are involved um, panel, which is non-vegetation non-vegetated uh, microsites. And you can see PC1 and PC2 both positively predict uh, uh, dispersal in non-vegetated areas. You see that positive relationship, but we don't really see an effect of principal components on dispersal probability for most of these microsites, uh, the vegetated microsites rather. The exceptions are two um, plants, the Lupinus, Arenteus, and Senecio crassilis. And just as a little reminder, these are the plants that are just balls and sticks is what I call them. They don't have a lot of basal vegetation and a, a very simple uh, kind of leaf ar architecture that's mostly top heavy. 
So these plants, uh, yeah, essentially principal components drive whether uh, dispersal occurs when there's low basal vegetation. So to look over a big overview, um, seed trapping and retention are a type of uh, seed plant interactions and they occur during that dispersal process. Um, it also highlights that these abiotic um, dispersal processes, rather than, rather than just being stochastic, difficult to parameterize interactions, they're still difficult to parameterize, but they're not necessarily stochastic. They're, uh, they're driven by these uh, functional traits and attributes of both the seed and the vegetation. Um, and that can give us a lot of insight into which dispersal interactions are gonna be sensitive to things like rain shifts, um, intense land use, um, and also um, helps us understand community assembly mechanisms and why some species co-occur with each other versus others. It's not just about these um, interactions at that first filter of, an, of the environment um, and positive facilitation that's occurring at stressful environments, it's also mechanical properties. And so to that, I add my own arrow. Thank you. Thanks, Courtney, and congratulations. Uh, I'm wondering how generalizable this is to different kind of ecosystems, like you're working in a kind of extreme, like low vegetation system and um, in other types of vegetation systems or like how broad do you think this mechanism is? I, I think it's gonna be most common in windy environments or places with um, low density of vegetations. I expect it to be common, for example, in the Arctic, like in, in tundra steppes, in the desert. Um, when I'm walking around, I, I often just look under plants to see what's occurring. And it's, it is a, it's definitely um, in those environments where there's opportunities for seeds to move freely. They do uh, congregate under vegetation. Um, but equally well, a lot of these, like, um, plants that are really prone to wind dispersal, such as dandelions, they get catch, they get caught in everything, uh, spider webs to uh, leaves just being a little sticky and they just get stuck to the leaf. So I think sea trapping and retention are, are common in all environments and then might be a dominant processes in some environments over others. Um, it's going to be a, I'm not a plant biologist question, um, but does seed retention usually lead to the seed like at, like growing right there under the plant? Like, is it is this beneficial for that seed, or is it then going to lead to competition? Like, what is the like outcome in the long term for the retention process? I think what is most important is that it indicates, assuming that the seed uh, persists there for an entire you know, winter, over winter is there, and that's where the conditions it experiences when it germinates. Um, where it gets trapped is the biological and environmental context that um, seed experiences during that first year um, and later in life. But I think especially critically, being able to have juvenile survival in the system is one of the major uh, hurdles to um, persistence in this community. And it's also increasing juvenile survival is also, um, if you just add small tweaks to that, that causes large increases in population growth rates. Um, and so these types of interactions drive a lot of the population dynamics in these communities. This is really interesting. Thank you. Um, I was just wondering if you've thought about, so like you have this other, this new arrow here and like in terms of like potential future work by you or others, like how you might parse apart like species co-occurrence based on these mechanisms versus the abiotic factors and stuff. Yeah, I think disentangling that is gonna be a long-term challenge. So this is the 
census that we have kind of occurring a little bit higher in the um, upslope from these experiments is a long-term census that involves about 2,000 individuals um, um, of these species. Um, I have location data for all of those individuals, and this upcoming summer will be the 10th year of data collection of um, collection, collecting data on survival, growth, and reproduction of all of those individuals. And so what I can do and kind of planned analyses, especially at, after we get maybe like five or maybe even 10 more years of data is to look at how factors like um, kind of climatic trends, like how much snow there was in a given year, how much summer rain there was, um, drive those demographic rates of like survival growth and reproduction versus um, other factors like who your neighbors are and whether who your neighbors are can be better predicted by um, the climatic experiences you had or if it could be explained by your probability of interacting through trapping or retention. And so we have some of these data in terms of, we know, for example, um, seeds with a pappus might not be, um, may not be expected to occur next to a plant that doesn't have a lot of basal vegetation. So we can start to ask those questions too with that long-term data set. Thank you very much, Courtney. Alrighty, folks, we are going to take a 15 minute break. So uh, we'll see you back here at 345 for some department awards. Um, in the meantime, don't forget about our photo contest out in the lobby. This is your last chance to drop in your vote and we'll be announcing who is the winner of the took the most beautiful picture award. So thank you. Be back in 15. <laughs>